Hey, you know, it always seems like we're in the middle of an election cycle. We're, we're either on the back side of an election or we're heading into the next one. Well, elections have consequences that affect the pocketbook of our clients, the American people, the American saver, the American retiree. On this episode, we have a very special guest, Becky Swansburg, an expert when it comes to taxation, taxation risk, and how to mitigate it. She's also a Washington insider, so think of this as a guided tour of what's going to be going on in the 2024 election cycle and the potential consequences for our clients. Now, more importantly though, stick around through the whole conversation because Becky talks about what you should be doing Q4 of 2023. Check it out. I wanted to pick your brain. I wanted to get an update for everybody um, on what's going on legislatively, how it's going to impact us uh, in the financial services industry. And there's no better person to speak to than you. Um, so let's just jump right in and let's talk about. So we're, you know, we're here fall of 2023. Big elections coming up in 2024. Yeah, what maybe is, you've heard. I've heard. I've seen that, you know, he's starting to get the fundraiser uh, letters and emails and yeah. texts and just about every doggone thing. But. Um, where should we start? 2024 election, it's going to be a big deal. What's going on? Yeah, it's interesting. The 2024 election, the presidential election, and uh, obviously House and some of the Senate up for election, mm -hmm. comes at a very interesting time because we're just coming off summer. We had the debt ceiling debate. We have President Biden trying to get his 2024 budget uh, approved through Congress. And both parties, because we have divided government, Republicans in control of the House, Democrats yep. tight control of the Senate, and then obviously our president uh, being a Democrat, both parties are going to throw a lot out. I think a, not a lot is going to get through. Yeah. Uh, certainly nothing with negative impact will get through because nobody wants to take responsibility <laughs> for anything bad uh, before that election occurs. Oh, yeah, going into it. No one wants to be tagged with something. Yeah. So what about, you know what, we were, we, we were, we were talking off... Uh, off air, but uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm going to throw this from left field because we weren't talking about it, but it just popped in my it. head. But um, you know, one of the things that was such a big promise, um, and it, it does affect this conversation, but uh, what's going to happen with student loans? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, a lot of kind of the extra money that is in the economy right now mm -hmm. from those stimulus checks, but also from the deferral of those student loan payments. Uh, it was interesting that the courts got involved in that a little. Uh, I do think if the Democrats hold on to the presidency and can get control of both the House and Senate, they may be able to pass some kind of relief for some savers. Yeah. But if it were me and my student loans, I'd want to make sure my budget is ready to keep paying those back. Keep That's, that one seems like it not being political, but you know, I've got kids that went through college. Now, that one almost seemed like a... I hate to say bait and switch, but um, that seemed like a heck of a promise that, uh, you know, a couple of years in hasn't come to fruition. Yeah, it is. Um, that is what I would call a very typical just vote getting proposal. Yeah. Right. I'm going to give you something that really helps you. I know that's going to make you think favorably about me and my party. A pretty transparent approach on that, and I think they didn't think it'd get quite as tangled up in the courts as it has. Yeah, it sure has. Okay, well, so I, I didn't mean to derail us from that, no. but so um, 2024 election, as we look at it for savers and advisors, uh, any big things that we should be keeping an eye on? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We're all focused on the 2024 election, but a lot mm -hmm. of the most pressing things coming down the runway for U.S. savers and that their financial professionals are going to have to prepare them for I think are going to come to fruition no matter who wins. Who wins? We mm. could have another Biden presidency, another Trump presidency, or someone from the field. Uh, so much of of the challenge that our nation has right now fiscally is not necessarily coming from Democrat or Republican proposals. It's coming from having an aging demographic that is yeah. relying heavily on our social services, putting pressure on Medicare, on uh, Social Security. It comes from. Are, and, you know, that's all not discretionary spending. Congress isn't passing a bill that gives Medicare to people. People are aging into that benefit. Yeah. Uh, our debt is now, you know, 32 plus trillion dollars. You have mm. to kind of check it weekly to see what it is. Uh, and that's not going to reduce any time soon. The other piece on top of that that has us in fiscal trouble is that with uh, interest rates higher right now, mm -hmm. the federal government is actually having to pay higher interest rates to service our own debt. Mm -hmm. So I think I read in Q2 of 2022, or in Q4, the last quarter of 2022, they paid over $60 billion of additional debt service payment 
just because of where interest rates are right now. So when you kind of look at all of this, our demographics and our fiscal situation, uh, I think long term, regardless of what politicians are promising for the upcoming election, taxes are going to go up yeah. and we are going to enter into this rising tax environment, especially for upper middle class and above Americans. And that's what I think financial professionals need to prepare for. Yeah, the taxation, I mean, it just there's just so much that's got to be paid for. And, and what you were just saying when I think about that, like that, that it's not, like you said, it, it's just a demographic that is aging into these benefits. Yeah. The promises were made. They actually kind of set the table, if you think about it. Yeah. They, did a, they did a great job coming out of World War II and setting the table yeah. for, uh, uh, for themselves. But there's all these things to pay. And in fact, the higher interest rates, paying a higher interest rate on your debt reminds me of the Discover card I had when I came out of college. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with rising taxation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things with that looming on the horizon, one thing we do know is the Trump tax cuts or TCJA. Yeah. Did I get that right? Um, we know that that's sunsetting. Does it sunset the beginning of 25 or the end of 25? So that'll sunset in 2025 so okay. that our 2026 filing will be our first tax year under the old uh, older rates. Okay. So after 2025, we revert back to our older, higher uh, income tax bracket rates. And there's a couple brackets there where there's some pretty significant jumps, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. The, uh, if, if you're kind of a middle saver in America, uh, maybe before the tax cuts, your uh, bracket was maybe at a 28%, and now it's down at 22 So there's about a 30% jump mm. that some brackets could take to normalize to more historic levels. We're actually, it doesn't feel like in April, in April when we have to pay our taxes, but we're actually in a very low tax bracket rate environment today yeah. because of that uh, 2017 uh, Trump tax cuts. And that's about to go away. And I think we've forgotten how high our brackets used to be. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a, that's going to be an owie. So do you yeah. think so? I guess in my mind, um, by my cynical mind, when I look at politics, uh, whoever whoever's in power is not going to continue something the other per, the other the person yeah. before did because they want to put their stamp on it, you know, uh, and, and, you know, I'm responsible for this and maybe maybe get their name on it. Are we going to see the same thing? Is there any chance that it doesn't sunset? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, mostly, if we look back, going back to the uh, maybe Kennedy tax cuts in the 60s, mm -hmm. mostly tax bracket reductions are allowed to sunset, mainly because the political value of those have already been used up. Yep. Right? So maybe they'll pass something else in the future, but you just don't want to extend what's already there. You don't get the benefit of having done something for the American people. That's right. Now, there have been some rumbles that maybe for lower and lower middle class Americans, they'll try to do something to keep these tax rates a little low. But I think if you've got savers that are, you know, $100,000, $200,000 annual income or above, they need to have it on their radar that taxes are going up. God. Taxes are going up from their brackets and from other ways that I think Congress is going to find to creatively tax them. Now, we were talking a little bit creative, uh, which <laughs> feeds which feeds right into this next question in, in one of our talking points was, um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the president uh, and the party in, in power right now keeps saying no new taxes under 400,000? Oh, yeah. So how many times have we heard in the campaigns in the State of the Union in uh, President Biden's 2024 budget proposal, yep. this, don't worry, if you make less than $400,000 a year, you'll never pay a penny of new taxes. Yeah. And so I think it's actually given a lot of uh, clients and American savers this false confidence that they're only going after more of the ultra rich yeah. in these reforms. And I just don't see long term a path where that can hold true. Number one, 2026 comes, all of our tax bracket rates are reverting unless Congress passes a new piece of legislation. Yeah. So I think already that 400,000 promise is a little untrue. But the other reason I think long-term uh, people with lower incomes, maybe anything in the six figures from 100,000 to 400,000, can't really breathe a tax sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. If you look at federal revenue that comes from individual income tax brackets, uh, Individual income taxes on people that make $400,000 and above only represents about 40% of our tax revenue. If you bring that down to 200000 yeah. and above, suddenly that impacts about 65% uh, of our tax revenue. And if we can have a new or expanded tax on people making $100,000 a year and above, that represents 89% of tax revenue. So on, almost nine-tenths of all of our tax revenue you can grow, but it has to be on people that make 100000 yeah. and above. There's just, there aren't enough U.S. earners 
earning over half a million dollars to fund the government just with their taxes. And, you know, we were talking uh, yesterday, we were talking about, you know, that when tax brackets were at these like crazy, yeah. alter, like everyone likes to point out that, you know, in, in oh God, what year was what, that? What, in like, like the 30s seven? and 40s, we had like these 90% uh, tax brackets were the top bracket. Yeah. But, you know, those really only applied to a very slim portion of Americans, maybe less than 100 Americans. So, yeah. like, Andrew Carnegie was not having a great time <laughs> with those tax brackets. Maybe that's why he did all those libraries for, probably, the, for a deduction. Probably. We've got some of those Plus in Louisville. Hard, actually. Yeah. yeah, down here, too. Yeah. Uh, but when you look at today's top tax rates, uh, they apply to many, many, many Americans. We've kind of done away with this tax bracket environment where we have one that is just for the ultra, ultra wealthy. Mm -hmm. And so most changes to the top brackets impact a lot of savers. And it's funny, I'll say to people all the time, you may not think you're rich, but you might be surprised to learn that Washington definitely thinks yeah. you're rich. Yeah. What yeah. feels rich uh, in the eyes of Congress can sometimes not feel rich for us as we're managing yearly uh, budget flow. Absolutely. You know, it's funny, the, um, it, it, is, it is funny that I was just looking at something about where an article where it had, it was survey results of what Americans think you need to have for retirement to, feed, to be comfortable or to be wealthy. And they had these numbers. And then, um, you know, how do you expect your retirement to be? And it was like, oh, we're going to, you know, it's going to be this. How much do you have saved? And it's like, boom. Like, it's, it's scary. I think, uh, I think a lot of people are going to have a big eye opening and then a, um, they're going to be working a lot longer than they think, unless they get cracking. I figure cra and I think the other challenge is that um, the vast majority of U.S. savings dollars are saved in these tax-deferred vehicles, yeah. IRAs and 401ks. So all of our retirement tax bills are just pushed to the future. Mm -hmm. Well, that might have been okay kind of for the greatest generation, these generations where in retirement they really want to tighten everything up. But today's generations want to maintain their lifestyle in retirement. Yeah. And I truly believe a lot of savers are going to be surprised that their taxes, one, do not dramatically lower magically just because mm -hmm. they've retired, and two, with some of the legislative environment in Washington, could even be going up. Yeah. It. Uh, do you think they'll? Do you think there will come a time um, where those vehicles are uh, Uncle Sam reaches in or starts eyeing those differently, or even non qualified money that's that's sitting there? Yeah, it's been interesting. Uh, if you remember back to two, 2021, the Democrats in the House introduced the Build Back Better legislation, mm -hmm. and it was about a three point five trillion dollar spending bill. And of course, to accompany that, it included about uh, $2.9 trillion of new taxes, which is not surprising when Congress passes spending, they like to put some taxes sure. with it, even the balances. What was surprising, though, and what's I think important to our listeners, is so much of that $2.9 trillion in new taxes was coming out of retirement accounts. And they were proposing a lot of new ways to tax IRAs and 401ks, uh, especially for people that have large account balances. So basically, Congress is going to come in and try to say, hey, at some point, Dennis, you've saved too much for retirement. Mm -hmm. Now it's greedy, and now we're going to tax you differently Shame on, you. on the extra stuff. Shame on you. Do you. So, well, let me ask you one that I've always wondered about, yeah. too. The, uh, the Roth IRA seems mm -hmm. like a steal. Like, it's, yeah. it's like a deal that actually is such a good deal that, is that one that's ever in jeopardy? Does that come up a lot? It's a good question. Um, they could, in theory, uh, change the rules around Roths. Maybe your contributions continue to uh, grow tax-free, but the growth is then taxed. Yeah. I think what they're more likely to do is dramatically limit the ability of people to do Roth conversions, where yeah. you're taking qualified funds, paying the taxes, and putting it in a Roth account. And then, of course, what they've already done some of, which is limit the ability to save in a Roth account yep. from the jump. Uh, it's interesting. Roth accounts help Congress get the tax revenue now, but uh, the IRS isn't dumb. Like, they know yeah. math. They know that the more assets you have growing, if they can tax the harvest and not the seed, they're going to be due more tax revenue. So, uh, you know, Roth accounts have been great, but I think there is some incentive mm -hmm. to let the funds grow in qualified accounts. So what do you see uh, if you're willing to put on your Punxsutawney Phil hat? That's right. Um, I love just saying that word. Uh, it's fun. Um, so as you look, uh, do you want to make any bold predictions? About the election? About, yeah, about life in general? Taxation. What, do you, what, are, what are things that, what are things that yeah. let me rephrase it. What are things that you're watching that you're a little fr fearful of? Not fearful yeah. of, but a little gives you a little uh, sleepless nights. Yeah. And um, what are they? Anything? So the number one thing I watch for is divided government. Mm. 
-hmm. I think uh, actually, I know it creates a lot of partisan uh, inner fighting, but I think divided government helps prevent bad legislation from getting through quickly yeah. because it has to be fought out. So one of the things that mm. I watch as we look at this election is, are we going to, you know, do the Democrats hold on to the presidency, keep the Senate, and then retake the House? Can the Republicans make some progress in the Senate? I think divided government is less risky for American yeah. savers because yeah. we don't get these flash bills that you know, are kind of a campaign victory lap for the uh, winners of this election coming through. Absolutely. Uh, any other legislation, any other trends, anything that's on your radar? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, we've already seen Republicans have introduced in the House legislation to expand the standard deduction. So mm -hmm. we're seeing some tax discussion there. Obviously, a lot of tax discussion around estate tax, the exemptions. Um, I think a lot of our tax activity is probably going to be focused on maybe 200,000 and above, but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that people maybe making 100 to 200 should uh, breathe a sigh of release because one, a lot of it's not inflation adjusted. Yeah. I oh, will yeah. say this. Yeah. Um, I do think that regardless of the outcome of the election, the biggest thing that drives this instability and this unpredictability in terms of what's our tax environment going to be how our retirement savings going to be viewed is not actually Republicans or Democrats. It's just our two-year election cycle. And so the fact hmm. that in America, we have new government every two years, which means if you're happy with the situation now, you might not be happy with it two years from now. That's a very good point. And because of that, I think savers, regardless of how they feel about the current administration or the next administration, they need to make sure that their retirement assets are diversified in a way that they have some protection, protection against the risk of rising taxes, some protection mm -hmm. against these legislative changes that uh, I do think are coming for qualified accounts. I, I love the I love the approach that you all take because it's just it's just the eye on taxation and looking at it that way and, and mitigating tax risk. A lot of times that gets left off the table when it's like 60, 40. Well, that, that's part of it, but we need to talk about this. Right. And I'm always surprised how often you sit you know, across from a saver and they've done so much work to diversify their portfolio in the market. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I have small cap, large cap, you know, fixed income. And maybe they've done some annuity work and they've diversified their income. So they have guaranteed income and variable income. And then you get to taxes and it's like, well, 100% of what I've got is in qualified funds. Absolutely. It's just the final piece to kind of complete that diversification for clients. Well, so let me ask you this. So we're, uh, and I'm going to get this episode pushed out ASAP. So we're, uh, we're towards the end of September here. Mm -hmm. And I know that as a, as a former advisor, I know that now we, we go into this last quarter and yeah. you're reaching out to clients, you're doing tax loss harvesting, you're, you're setting up the year, any RMDs, different things like that. Mm -hmm. What should an advisor be doing as they, any tips that you have, any advice that uh, if you were out there, like, hey, you should be looking at this over the next couple yeah. of months? I think the important thing for clients to evaluate is between now and the end of the year, uh, do they have a desire to convert qualified funds, any of their funds into mm -hmm. a tax-free vehicle? Because we know the Trump tax cuts expire in 25, yep. which means that we have this limited window to convert funds. And I would hate for clients who want to do that to lose 2023 as a year to make that first piece That's of conversion. Really good point. So between now and the end of the year is a critical time to figure out, you know, do they have a retirement tax bill problem? Do they want to convert funds? And if so, let's get one extra year before those rates go up in 26. This is a great, so I'm going to paraphrase. This is a great opportunity if you're an advisor to be reaching out. Don't yeah. don't goof around because I know we head into that uh, that lull around, you know, you've got Thanksgiving and well, you know, there's Christmas coming. Holidays. My clients, you know, no one wants to meet. You should be on the ball jumping all over this, right? Yeah, the, the urgency is real. Yeah, and then um, uh, so as we look for as we look forward, mm -hmm. um, as somebody who's been on Capitol Hill, this is a random. This will be the question we can wrap up. With, I love but, it. Um, so I saw that I believe the Senate changed their dress code. Your two cents on it? My two cents on it is uh, Congress is steeped in tradition. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the dress code has to do not just with are we comfortable, but what is the decorum? I agree. And uh, I don't know. For me, keeping that decorum, that seems that it, it you know, watch the British House of Commons sometime uh, on CNN or on, CN, uh, you know, on uh, C-SPAN. C-SPAN, yeah. Uh, and it's wild. People screaming at each other. So now they are screaming at each other in coat and tie, I recognize. Yeah. But I just think, you know, to try to keep, particularly the Senate, as a house where uh, legislators come together and have discussions that are not personal but are, you know, for the good of the country, 
maybe maybe being a little buttoned up helps that. I agree. You know, the staffs all have to stay buttoned up. I know. They're, yeah, that's the crazy thing. Their dress code didn't change. I say that sitting here in jeans. So, you know, maybe they just want a little comfort. <laughs> But uh, I will tell you, it was interesting. I worked in the Bush White House under George W. Bush's uh, Mm -hmm. first administration, and that White House kind of had this tradition of, you know, the president doesn't even unbutton his coat button when he's in the Oval Office. Oh, my. And it did set a tone. It set a tone. So sorry for people that have to continue wearing uncomfortable clothes, but I I think it's probably for the good. It's just the way it is. All right, Becky, thanks for being on here. Uh, I really appreciate it. You bring such a... uh, you're so accessible. You're such an accessible touchstone to a topic that, you know, a lot of times is like, oh, legislation or um, it's just such a sometimes an unapproachable topic. So to be able to uh, to use you as a Rosetta Stone uh, to understand what's going on is unbelievable. And I thank you for being here. And for everybody else, um, of course, wherever you like to consume podcasts, I'm going to ask you for a favor. Um, love it if you'd click like. Uh, Would really love it if you would subscribe, um, leave a comment, leave a rating. Uh, But if you do subscribe, the beauty of subscribing is that you are then notified anytime we drop a new episode. So we're out there on YouTube. We're out there on Apple, Spotify, Pandora, iTunes, um, iHeartRadio. I'm a subscriber myself. There we go. Uh, We are everywhere. So uh, Becky, again, thanks for being here. Thanks for having uh, me. We'll see you all next time.